the Holy Gospel, according to Matthew, the 11th chapter. Glory to you, you, O God. But to what will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to one another, We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We wailed, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. Then he began to reproach the cities in which most of his deeds of power had been done, because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the deeds of power done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, on the day of judgment, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, Will you be exalted to the heaven? No, you will be brought down to Hades. For if the deeds of power done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you that on the day of judgment, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom than for you. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you that are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us open with a word of prayer. Good and gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. A long time ago, I'm going to call it a long time ago in my life, when I was about 18 years old, I, through a bunch of circumstances, I ended up uh, finding myself one Christmas starting to eat and eat and eat. Do you ever done that? <laughs> they talk about your body changing when you're 11 or 12, but they don't really talk about the changes when you're 18. The life changes, the body changes, so I ate and I ate and I ate some more. And I'd eat so much that I, that I, would, I made myself throw up once. And then I ate and ate and ate some more. And then I ate so much, I made myself throw up one more time. And I ate and ate and ate some more, and I made myself throw up one more time. And I thought, well, this isn't a problem. This is only three times. It's not a habit. It's not a problem. Finally, by the sixth or seventh time, a couple months down the road, I found myself crying in the bathroom, realizing that this was a problem. That while the cheesecake, the whole cheesecake, tasted really good. The throwing up was a problem. They call it bulimia. I did it about 12 times. It took in three months, gained 30 pounds. It took me, turns out the medication I was taking causes depression, there you go. But it, ta it took me two years, two years to totally get over that episode psychologically, 
It took me Africa to really have a different relationship with food. Addiction. Addiction. That time where you find a coping strategy, you find something to help you, as I did with my depression, and, and maybe it's food for you. Maybe it's work for you. It can be something good. Maybe it's exercise for you. Well, food is good, right? Maybe it's drugs. Maybe it's alcohol. But you find something, and it feels really good. And then you realize that it's a problem. And suddenly, it's no longer good, but suddenly it has control over you. Suddenly, it dictates your life. Addiction. I think we understand this because I think if we're honest, all of us have our go-to addiction. I'm not saying that these addictions, the actions, are sin. But what I want to say is that that's the pattern of sin. The pattern of sin with a capital S that Paul talks about. This is not, I did something wrong. This action is sin. This is sin, the power that separates us from God, that controls our life instead of letting the Spirit control our life. Paul talks about the body in two different ways. He talks about this beautiful, created body that we have that is made and built to glorify God to be a vessel for God's goodness and God's peace and God's love in the world. And then he talks about, and that word soma is that word in Greek. Not that you need to know the Greek. Then he uses the word sarps, which is the Greek word for flesh. This is the body that is misused. The body that is bound to this capital S sin, this power that separates us from God. This power that has this same control over us. So that we end up in this tug of war. And it starts because, well, I did this. I sinned. And I liked it. But then it starts to take control of our life. And then we end up in this tug of war that Paul talks about. Where I do not do what I want to do. But I do the very thing that I don't want to do. I know it's a problem. I'm crying on the floor, but I do it anyway. And we do it in big or small ways as people. Every time that we fall away from one another and away from love and away from God, this sin, this power creeps up in our lives. And it's this constant tug of war between the sin and the spirit, the spirit that comes to live within us, that comes to share God's love with us, to comes to make us a vessel to glorify God. We find ourselves then on our knees in that bathroom floor, metaphorically or really, not just as individuals, but as a society, because sin controls us when we are struggling with wanting to go after power and wealth at all costs, right? We find ourselves on this bathroom floor, and we find ourselves crying out to God that same question that Paul cries out. Who will rescue us from this body of death? Who will rescue us from this body of death, this sarks, this flesh, this sin with a a capital S? It is in the midst of this daily reality, this daily tug of war, that we come together in this community and we proclaim that our core values stem from this proclamation. With Christ as the center of our community, we dot, dot, dot. We speak over it so quickly, but it's the foundation of our core values. With Christ as a center of our community, we dot, dot, dot. We do what we do. We are who we are because of our faith. We our values are our values because of our faith. It is the same sentiment 
that Paul says when he proclaims, thanks be to God, through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is the same sentiment, the same promise that Jesus gives us when he says to us, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, good, kind, useful. For my yoke is good, and my burden is light. To that cry, who will rescue us from this body of death, from this sin with a capital S, we join Paul in proclaiming that Christ is the center of our community, and we long to be yoked to him. So here's my question. Because I don't know about you, but I think that's strange. Why would we long to be yoked to anything? That's not freeing, that's binding. Why would we long to be yoked to anything? Anyone have a thought? I hear it in the Song of Solomon, that book of poems between a lover and the beloved. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. The message of Christ on the cross. When we are yoked to sin and we push away God's love, we push Christ straight to the cross. And on that cross, he says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. On that cross, he offers us love. On that cross, he says, arise, my fair one, and come away with me. Be filled with my spirit. There is no greater love than that. And nothing reveals God's love greater than that. That is our proclamation. That's why we yoke ourselves to Christ. And it's not just that. Because we also move with Christ into the resurrection. And that resurrection, that walking out of that tomb, that new life, that is our experience of Emmanuel, our name, Emmanuel, God with us to the end of the age. That is the promise. In the cross and the resurrection, we experience the unfettered love of God that says, arise my love, my fair one, Come away. That is the baptismal promise. The baptismal promise that we are offered and that we are given that drowns us to the sin with a capital S and raises us to new life in the Spirit with a capital S. In the Spirit with a capital S. So if that's why, then what does it look like? yoked to Christ. What do you think? I have some thoughts about this. Two oxen are yoked with one another, and Jesus says, take my yoke upon you, and I will teach you, and you will learn from me. Two oxen are yoked together, and when they are yoked together, they can be more easily guided. So they, they can be controlled where they go and directed. So our yoke and being yoked to Christ teaches us. Teaches us a new way of life. That baptismal life. We call it discipleship. A new way of life. We call it discipleship. And this determines our core values. It determines our life direction, our daily decisions, and all of our behaviors. It guides us forward as we are yoked. The other thing that this yoke does is it gives, Jesus says it gives us rest. And you think about those two oxen yoked together. One alone may not be able to carry the heavy burden, but two together not only have direction, but they share the load. They give one another rest. They give one another purpose. We are yoked to Christ. It's not just a pretty sentiment that says, 
that Jesus shares all of our burdens, which, yes, I do believe that's true. But it's a mission and a purpose that says, take my yoke upon you, that we share Christ's burden. That we share Christ's burden so that we have direction and we partner with Christ in Christ's mission and purpose. Being yoked to Christ means that we share in this mission together. We call it a purpose here at the church. And what is Christ's mission? Jesus, just a few verses beforehand, when John says through his disciples in prison, are you the Messiah or are we to wait for another? Because he's doubting he's about to be beheaded. I would doubt too. Jesus says, go and tell John what you hear and what you see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news brought to them. We are yoked to Christ and we are given a purpose in life. To be a part of Christ's mission of healing and liberating all people and all creation, especially those whom our world undervalues and says isn't good enough and pushes to the margins. We are yoked to Christ for the purpose of healing and liberating. Ultimately, this church, our church, the greater church, is not meant to be a rest and a retreat from the world. It's meant to be a school of love. A school of love, a place where we experience the unfettered love of Christ that says, Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. And we are yoked to Christ. It's meant to be a school of love where here we partner with one another in being yoked and we share one another's burdens and we share this mission together. And we practice this love with one another. And we practice this love together out in the community. It's meant to be a school of love where from here we are sent forth to live Christ's mission daily. The mission of loving through healing and liberating all creation. This isn't just another pretty sentiment to be kind to others. This is a call to give our life, to dedicate our whole life for others. Not just for the sake of the other, but for the sake of our own life. Because that is that discipleship way of life that leads to true, abundant life. It's the promise that in that yoke, we find true life in the Holy Spirit, now and always. Amen. Amen.